Okay, everybody, welcome. All right, thank you so much tonight for being here. This is instructor presentations. It's first day of class. We like to invite the visiting instructors just to come up here and give a talk about their work, a little bit about themselves. So thank you for being here. We have four instructors speaking for this evening. And I just wanna welcome everyone on Zoom. Thank you so much for tuning in. And our first instructor in the blacksmith shop, we all know her and love her. It's Anna Complick and Sean Fitzgerald. We'll introduce her. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Fitzsimmons, the blacksmithing uh, shop assistant here. I could do a 10 minute presentation on how good Anna Complick is, but I'll keep it short for you before her own. Uh, She's my mentor, my leader, my boss, uh, and the best in the world. She graduated from Pratt with a BFA in jewelry in uh, 2015. She's been a professional blacksmith for about eight years, traveling all across the country, working in different shops and teaching all along the uh, East Coast and elsewhere. She's teaching at Penland coming up soon. And she's a little uh, ready to do it, some utensils. Um, she's got a delicate, refined forging style. She's a people person, loves the color purple, and unicorns and has made the, the best spoons I've ever seen in my life. So here she is, Hannah Copley. Cool. Thanks, Sean. I have a lot of feelings. Um, all right, cool. Well, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so just to start off, I'm going to explain a little bit about what I do, and then I'm kind of just going to be telling you about my weird life. Um, so it's more about like the path I've been on necessarily about the work that I've made when I'm not working at craft schools. I'm jumping from shop to shop, making weird, big metal stuff, railings, gates, all that kind of stuff. So, so this is me on a couple jobs around the country, uh, just forging out big metal and laying out stuff on fab tables and having a lot of fun. Uh, this was me when I was little. Uh, this is how I started. I've always liked weird, fun, pretty clothes, uh, getting dressed up, bright colors, um, and a lot of weapons. I thought I have an older brother. Uh, so I got to get all of his old weapons and play with them. So put together my own outfits, obviously. So um, I started doing metal work when I went to school for jewelry. Uh, I got kind of really into sheet metal work. Uh, and I was also still obsessed with weapons, just like I had been when I was little. Um, um, so I was in school I kept focusing on weaponry and I started getting into forging and my thesis was focused on the idea of where pieces that fit on my body weren't going to hurt me but if anyone came near me they were going to get cut which I was really excited about we good we're good all right we're good cool so that's some of the stuff that I made when I was in school um after I graduated, I came to Piers Valley and I had my first sort of real blacksmithing job. I was the assistant here uh, and I was still really obsessed with weapons at that point. I made my second sword, um, which is this one right here. I made a whole bunch of tomahawks, other weapons, but I also realized like everything else there is in blacksmithing. I made tools for the first time, I made utensils, and that's what I really realized I was falling in love with. Uh, that is me the summer that I was an assistant here with my old boss, Jake. Um, after I finished my assistantship here, I ended up going out to another craft school, Touchstone, out in Pennsylvania, and I ran their shop for two years, still focusing more on like functional work and utensils. Uh, and during that time, I also had my first architectural blacksmithing apprenticeship where I was learning how to do welding, fabrication, scroll work, stuff like that picture on the right where I'm putting together all these components into a piece meant for a home. Uh, from there, I moved out to Long Island and really dived more into the architectural work. Uh, so I was working at a bigger production shop making large scale architectural pieces, big 
railings, like a typical day on the job could just be like, here, make a hundred of these scrolls. And so like that was after like half a day is that pile of scrolls on the floor there. And those all would get assembled together, put into railings, welded together, ground, finished, and ultimately doing the installs as well, which is something not a lot of blacksmiths like, I weirdly like, I don't know why. Uh, this was a big pergola that I worked on. I did the full like scroll panels on the ends of that piece and all the layout work for assembly. Um, I might've gotten heat stroke that day, uh, but we installed the pergola, it looked great. Um, so, so this job, I did a lot of different architectural work, worked on like a team with other people. So a lot of times you'd be working together to make these large pieces, uh, doing staircase railings. Um, I did those like window and door grills there. This was at like a really fancy uh, little mansion in the Hamptons. Um, so working on just like really, really weirdly fancy metalwork sometimes. Um, after that, I kind of jumped around a bunch. I did some residencies. I went back to Touchstone, did residency focusing more on tool making, uh, really diving more into tongs. And those of you who are in my class know how obsessed I am with tongs. Um, I, I did an internship at a place called Center for Metal Arts, uh, where I got to work on doing more high-end tools as well as doing more production tooling. So I would make just like a run of tongs for the shop and then learned a lot by having to do the same tool like 10 times and ultimately they have to look the same at the end. So that taught me a lot about production tool making. During all this time, I also kept working on utensils, started to um, just like play around with what my own style in forging was. And one of the things I would do a lot was just like take a scrap piece of metal that was left behind after another forge and just like a little nubbin of metal uh, and just like see how I could stretch and pull it. And it would end up being these like weird, like semi useless utensils. Um, and that sort of really delicate forging ended up being something that I'm still really obsessed with. Uh, I was also playing around with the idea of like a functional forging, like the a scissor handle and turning that into more of like a decorative element, um, like in the little coat rack there. Um, so that's still something that I'm continuing to explore and play with a lot. Um, right when COVID hit, I, uh, I just decided to go down to Texas. I was like, I'm going to go to this blacksmith conference and I'm either going to find a job this weekend or I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, and luckily I found a job that weekend because later that week, the entire world shut down. Um, and I ended up on this weird little hip commune thing on a cow ranch with metal shop in the middle, uh, managing a crew of other young blacksmiths we are all living out of trailers in the backyard and just forging hundreds of feet of bronze railing for this one big job uh, it was a bunch of both fabricated and forged work so like welded and uh blacksmithing um just again piles and piles of scrolls that's life sometimes uh while i was there i also got to do my first sort of solo um, railing job where it was this uh, 12 foot curved bronze balcony rail and on this piece I got to go all the way from designing it sampling making the tools all the way through forging fabricating grinding and finishing and it was the first time I'd gone to do that piece that large of a scale on my own um, there's me with my boss and one of my co-workers um, they're way less amused than I am but I was pretty happy um, while I was out in Texas, it was COVID. We couldn't go anywhere. I lived in a blacksmith shop. So all of my free time was just spent foraging. You'd clock out of a 10 hour day working and just start making whatever you wanted. So I dived back into a lot of tool making. I made a bunch more tongs, made a lot of hammers. I made weird little things. These are like tiny little sculpture -y things. Again, just the idea of like, what can I make from this scrap piece of metal? And I made weird things. Uh, I also had probably too much fun at times. <laughs> um, but it was pretty great. I was living with some of my best friends, made some new really good friends, and, and we just hung out, forged, and had fun. After Texas, I ended up 
back here at Peters Valley, we've come back here um, and made some amazing friends. You'll see some familiar faces there. Um, got a lot of work done in the shop last year with Sean. Uh, and I also sort of went back to utensils and started to develop what more of my current style in utensil forging is. Uh, and this is something that I'm going to continue to be exploring, I think, for a while, just figuring out both having a functional utensil, but also trying to make it my own. Um, also, sometimes non-functional because spatula arcs are great. <laughs> um, after I finished my summer here, uh, the more I travel, the more places I go to work, the more I learn. Uh, so when I travel, I live out of my truck. This is what my home looks like when I'm not here. Uh, just frame of reference. Uh, and I went and did like a whole loop around the country. I went out to Santa Fe. He did a lot of, um, in addition to architectural work, like smaller home good items and like production. So I was working on you know, see, like these bronze spoons, bottle openers, um, and a lot of it was trying to translate what he wanted done and then just like try and figure out how to forge it without him showing me anything, which was a really fun challenge. And he makes awesome work. It was good to learn from him. Um, I also went out to Chicago for a little bit um, and I got to work with some of my best friends out there doing a lot of chandelier work. That's a batch of chandeliers that we had finished. Um, and a lot of that is just like texturing hundreds of feet of bar under a power hammer. So like that's a, a day's work, all of that bar textured. That's where the scar, the, uh, scar came from. So that's those guys. Um, and while I was traveling, I also just like visited a whole bunch of awesome blacksmiths that I really look up to and love. Uh, I met some amazing people um, on the picture in the top right. That's Megan Crowley, who used to run the blacksmith shop here and was someone that I always dreamed of getting to meet. And I got to just like go hang out and have dinner with her and her kid. So that was amazing. Um, so, yeah, that was my weird life. Um, that's me with my truck Triton. Just an average morning on the road in my pajamas. Uh, and now we get to the portion where I just uh, show you a bunch of pictures of me being really excited at a lot of cool places. So there's me at White Sands, really excited. There's Grand Canyon. There's Death Valley. There's San Francisco. And then uh, I finished my travels. I made back to the Pizza Triangle. All right. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thanks very much, Anna. All right. Um, I just want to say to the people on Zoom, if you're having Wi-Fi internet troubles, I apologize. I think something's up with our Wi-Fi. So if it's such I'm sorry, we're doing the best that we can, but we have to move forward. The next speaker tonight in the Woods studio, Peters Valley's very own Jamie Herman and his assistant Jamie. Uh, oh my God, Jason Pax Winkowski will introduce him. Hello, everybody. I'm Jason, Woodshop Assistant. Um, I'm here to introduce James Dallas Herman. He's from Ohio, uh -huh. uh, was almost a professional musician, formerly a tomb exhumer, archaeologist. Uh, educated in snooty and non-snooty wood environments. May or may not have taught me everything I know. Lover of root beer barrels and big bears named Gerald. One of Jamie's best kept secrets is he actually invented the earplug. Um, he's one of the best bosses and supervisors I've ever had. I'm extremely thankful for our professional and non-professional relationship. Here we go, James Herman. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about pizza that's half pepperoni and half jalapeno. No, that one's me because it has my name on it. On it. Hey. Um, hello. I like to start my presentations out with a fun joke so we can all get to know each other and be comfortable with each other. Um, what's purple and conquered the world? Oh, no, uh, it's, the correct answer is Alexander the Great. 
Anyway, um, I'm Jamie. Um, I'm a woodworker, a sculptor, a uh, teacher. Um, I'm here this week um, teaching a class on beginning furniture making, um, which is something I really love doing. I love kind of getting people on these big, powerful, crazy tools for the first time. I just, uh, I think it's really awesome to see how empowering it is uh, to see people kind of maybe do something that's way out of their comfort zone um, with these these big, scary tools. I really love it. Um, I think we're having fun so far. I got a thumbs up for Mason, so we're having fun. Um, so my background, um, I never really thought much about craft for most of my life. Um, when I was a kid, my grandfather, who I never met, was a, a kind of hobbyist furniture maker. He was a janitor, um, but he had a little wood shop in his garage, and he would always um, make a bunch of stuff. And I never really knew him, but I knew of his furniture that kind of came through our house. Um, and uh, with the benefit of hindsight now that I'm good at woodworking, I realized he was not very good at woodworking. Um, but I always was really enamored with the idea of it. And when I was a kid, I told all the adults that I saw when they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I told them I wanted to be a carpenter, um, even though I don't really know if I knew what a carpenter was, and I didn't act on it until I was 26, so, um, but it was down there somewhere. Um, these slides are from kind of when the, I first started to think about craft, which was in college. Um, I majored in archaeology, um, so these are some pictures of me from an archaeological dig I did in Central America and Belize, so we we're excavating Mayan ruins, and on the left, that's me with a total station and Lily Walsh. And on the right is a huge bucket of pot shards that I dug up out of the ground. Um, and it was just, it was really interesting. It was really powerful uh, thinking about those objects and um, their provenance. Um, and then I got really disillusioned with the um, collegiate educational system. Um, I was planning on just pursuing a master's, going into a PhD, becoming an academic. Um, but I got really jaded in my fifth year of college and decided to go to the west coast um and i wanted to become a farmer so i started farming um at these farms but what i actually ended up doing was a ton of carpentry and a ton of forestry work so i'm on the left was me with my little plastic chainsaw and my chainsaw pants and um my job for several months out there i just lived in a tent I just logged this uh, bit of land into construction. That's me on the right, looking really fun, um, doing some concrete foundation work. Um, and then kind of on a lark, I accidentally enrolled in a woodworking program um, in Vermont. Um, so this big barn has three wood shops in it. Um, at one point, I lived in one of those silos on the bottom floor in a circular room, which was really cool. Um, but there were a lot of mice that lived in the wall, so that wasn't cool. Uh, and this was the first piece of furniture I ever designed and built. Um, and I was in way over my head. And um, I had a really awesome mentor who allowed me to get way in over my head. And we just figured it out together. And um, this piece is all veneered. So all of these triangles um, are all made out of MDF, um, which is kind of a, a gross type of fiberboard. Um, that's glued together with formaldehyde glue, which is really disgusting to work with. Um, and it's just kind of sheathed with really, really thin um, slices of wood. So, you know, the wood grain over top is about a 40th of an inch thick. Um, and this one, I, I just kind of didn't know what I wanted to build, but I was really obsessed with the platonic solids at the time. So this one was meant to look like it was kind of the top was unfolding off of this octahedral base. Um, and then I moved on in the program, and this was my second major project I built that is still one of my favorite things. Um, it was kind of a joke at the time. Um, there's a famous woodwork, woodworker named James Krenoff, and he was really famous for these cabinets on a stand. And I thought it would be a funny woodworking joke if I took that and I literally just kind of like a, made it askew and just kind of pulled it off its base and made it less perfect. Um, so I made this thing um, that's just this weird cabinet on a stand that's at this weird angle. And the weird angle makes all these really complicated woodworking problems that I had to solve. 
And for this project, I basically didn't let my mentor talk to me for the whole semester. And I just wanted to did, which I did end up making a lot of mistakes, but um, I was really proud of myself for having gotten through it. Um, and at this time, I was um, going through a really tough time with um, my mental health. Um, I was really struggling with anxiety, especially in depression. And um, I realized now that during this time I was making all of these pieces that were just like a little off kilter because that's how I was feeling most of the time I was constantly having this like terrible anxiety that I was just gonna faint in the middle of the room for some reason um so I made all this furniture that kind of looks like it's about to topple over or, or fall down this is a chair I made in my last semester it just has a bent leg I don't know why it just was what I was feeling at the time here's a little picture of the back of it and, you know, I like this piece still, but I feel like uh, it's an example of what happens when you really, really try too hard to impress people and make something as difficult as possible. And uh, I don't necessarily think it, you know, sings as a beautiful object, but it was very hard to make. Um, after graduating, I just kind of started working on some stuff that I thought was cool and kind of riffing on some ideas that I've had during school. Um, this is a, a wall hung cabinet that basically the idea was that, you know, there's this one cabinet that's flush up against the wall like it's supposed to be. And then there's this other one that's intersecting it and kind of it's the exact same object, but at a strange angle. And I was really into cutting dovetails at the time. That was my favorite thing to do. It's still something I really, really enjoy doing, um, but there's just dovetails all over this thing, which is just a fancy uh, woodworking joint. And I insisted on cutting everything by hand because it was very fancy and snooty at the time. Um, I also started working on lighting, which is something that still figures a lot into my work. And I uh, really love working on. I kind of, uh, a mentor of mine had this technique that he developed um, using fiberglass and epoxy to strengthen these sheets of wood veneer so that you can cut uh, shapes out of them and you can still get light through these, these wooden uh, um, shades. And I kind of worked with that technique and kind of developed it and made some more complicated stuff and kind of switched his, his way of doing things around a little bit and just kind of riffing on this idea a lot. Um, the one on the on the left is hanging in my bedroom. I really love. It's just got this really nice, like, soft, very warm glow. Um, and they're just I, I find them very calming. And there's something about that, like the light filtering through, through that organic material, that really appeals to me. Um, after that, I got into business for myself and became a self-employed furniture maker and realized how difficult that is and um, how hard it is to earn a living making things for a living. Um, so this was a my biggest commission from that time period, which was this dining table. Um, I way undercharged for it. I spent so many hours in the shop working on it and barely made anything. Um, but I'm still really proud of it. It's this circular table with this this weird base that's kind of intersecting itself at two dovetail shapes and then it extends and uh in the middle there that kind of veneer pattern is still echoed um i got a grant to make some tables from this weird uh furniture making organization in new hampshire and i think they gave me something like five hundred dollars to to buy materials and stuff and then i proceeded to spend probably like 200 hours on this project or more um so i i didn't i didn't really make out with this one but it's a fun project it was kind of uh i was trying to make make something you know perfectly identical to something else i started doing some more kind of pure sculpture this thing doesn't really have a purpose but it was a really fun thing to make this is all wood um and just the people in my class it's just wood just like edge glued together just like we did today with our tabletops um but with a lot of complicated angles and then i painted it with some uh just regular acrylic paint this was the last piece i made pre-covid which i, I kind of feel like was my last um in my series of weird things that look like they're falling over and shouldn't stand up um this one is also kind of a riff on that idea of having the same cabinet over and over again um but the trick with this one is that in the base there there's a piece of concrete and inside the concrete is three lead bars um that weigh about 35 pounds total that keep this thing standing up there's a little little peek in that door at the concrete brick 
Um, and then COVID happened. I chilled out and hid in Vermont for a while. And then I came here. This is the beautiful Delaware River where we go swimming every day. Um, it's been a lot of fun being here. I haven't made any giant projects, but I've been working on a lot of little stuff. This is a spoon I made in Abby's class last year. Uh, this little bandsaw box I made this year. It looks like a burb. And then um, I'm still kind of pursuing some residencies and some other stuff. Um, this is some stuff I made over the winter. I did a residency in Mid Coast, Maine at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, which is very snooty. Um, so just some more lamps I was working on. There's a chandelier I made for my sister's house. And then this was kind of a a a set of lamps that um, I sold to a friend of mine when I worked on this weird giant sculpture with all these heptagons that I still haven't completely finished, but I am excited to hang up uh, one day, kind of see it hanging from a ceiling in a big gallery or something. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's about it. Um, everyone, while you're here, please appreciate how beautiful this place is because it's really magical. This is the uh, sunset on Thunder Mountain and uh, this is Wally the Bear. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jamie. So welcome to I'm welcome to introduce a new instructor to Peters Valley. We welcome Alexis Martini. He is bringing life and color to the printmaking studio this week. And to introduce him, we have Lindsay Davis, our our um, artist fellow in the printmaking studio. There. <laughs> Hello. So born in Mexico City, Alex received his an MFA in printmaking from Tyler in 2005, a BA in fine art from St. Mary's College of Maryland in 2000, and completed a Fulbright Fellowship in Barcelona, Spain in 2001. Alex teaches at as an adjunct professor at Tyler and runs Dos Tres Press, a print shop in South Philadelphia where he maintains a print publishing business and develops collaborative print-based projects. He focuses on rigorous experimentation with relief print making techniques through hand-carved reduction wood block printing and the digital technology of plate making with CNC routing. Please welcome Alex. All right. Uh, uh, thanks for welcoming me. Great community. Um, I went to a college very similar in setting, um, and it's really awesome to be in a place like this again. Um, and yeah, uh, feel feel good to be here. Um, uh, this is a really serious talk, so you know. No, I you know by that introduction. No, um, I guess I, um, I guess I'll uh, I'll say that I, I've been working with this one specific medium for I don't know about over over 20 years um and so I, I guess when folks ask me like what I do I, I say I I'm a woodcut artist or a, a woodcut specialist um in printmaking there's a lot of different uh um mediums but I just focus on this one sort of very low-tech uh medium that you can really bring in a lot of experimentation and technology to it but in the end i just like squishing ink onto paper um and i do it collaboratively and i do it uh, which means i work with a lot of different artists uh, kids adults famous artists up and coming artists everything within this shop goes to this press um i guess before i begin i don't i don't really like come from anywhere i don't have like one place i've been i i i grew up in mexico uh sort of following my father along his like research um he moved to the u.s from chile so you know met my mother there and they just live there so um i kind of live in a lot of different places there and a lot of different places in the u.s um, but I sell, settled on Philly about 20 years ago. So I guess I could say that's real, where I'm really from. But that has definitely kind of like colored my experience um, and a lot of like the projects that I've done. So this is my print shop. Um, I love color. I love graphics. And I love experimenting with it. Um, these are so, this is some of my early work. Um, uh, it was really sort of like straightforward black and white graphics. Um, as soon as I graduated college, uh, I applied for a Fulbright, which was ridiculous. And even more ridiculous is that I got it. My professors are like, 
what what happened you know and nobody really thought that i was supposed to get that but i just came up with a really good idea of making woodcuts and recording the culture there so essentially i just were i would just go on the street the project was like a visual ethnography of barcelona ethnography just means it's like a written text which is what my father did he would write about the culture in mexico and i just proposed to do a visual one so i would just sit on the grimy streets of little alleys in europe and i would just sit there and carve these wood blocks right i would do all the stuff um i can't really get into like all the details and what each one of these images is about but needless to say i would just look at stuff and make carvings of it and one of the cool things that kind of happened there is i realized just how communal community-based printmaking was because people were used to plein air painting and they would see people painting like they get that but then they would just see had like long hair and like grubby and still a little bit maybe and people would be like what are you doing and i'd just be carving i'd be hacking away at these blocks and it turned into this thing where i would start teaching it and even though like fulbright sounds kind of fancy like they they didn't give you that much money so i found ways by like almost like teaching or really more like bartering with other artists either for food not that i didn't have means but it just became this thing that I, like i learned how to teach and use this medium to i don't know just exist in a, in a happy way and and just enjoy teaching it and i think this was like a really sort of like a predecessor to a lot of stuff you're going to see in a little bit which is like teaching and collaborating um this is at um and also just because of my upbringing i love traveling so it's like yeah i'll go to have the government pay pay me to go to spain and make woodcuts um this is my thesis show at uh temple rome so i got accepted into tyler school of art and they're like yeah you can go to rome to do part of your mfa i was like sign me up um and this is their gallery there and it's kind of the same idea still figuring out the content of my work but in the end i just love carving i just love getting a crappy piece of plywood and gouging it printing it most of this wood was a source from walking around the streets um or just whatever i could kind of find in the basement of that facility um my hat up there oh sorry it's showing me the next slide i'm thinking i'm seeing yeah no no you know <laughs> i'm like confused um so uh yeah that was that was my mfa show giant wood because look at me i'm so great at carving i'm so awesome very very kind of showy uh showy stuff maybe related to that chair that you were speaking of it's like yeah it was hard to make because it just took a lot of work but maybe not the best work um so this is me now um in my current print shop where i do a lot of collaborative printing um and i'm kind of taking big steps i did a lot of other things but one of the things i i like i realize is that i love working with people i like teaching i like passing along the knowledge um and what what ended up happening in, in in that process was that i got these tools that allow me to accelerate that and it's like a cnc router so i would program a tool that then carves my blocks for me um so this is one of the projects i've done for a philly based sculptor um on the left you can kind of see he does these sculptures of like cross sections um and that digital information and again this is like in the weeds like this this probably meant more for like an hour long talk but sorry um but if you can see like the those divisions and those cross sections like if i could just take like that ear and pull it out it would be like this cross section sculpture of, of something and what he did was just give me he works in cnc as well computer numerical control he designed something photographs it takes a digital scan of it and then turns it into these sculptures and the computer just creates those digital cross sections and then he uses the machine to make these things with cardboard acrylic steel and you know we're like hey let's do a project together and then i came up with with this image here which is like the flattened versions of his sculptures um i still love i think that one was out of order um 
but that's okay. That's the predecessor. I'm um, still, um, after doing all those black and white uh, images of just carving, I started getting into sort of like abstracted landscapes, showing large printmaking work, still kind of like, look at me, you know, I still, I, mean, I can't help it. I just like love the impact of walking into a, into a gallery and seeing that color and that carving. And in the end, this is a, a good setting for me because I'm not quite like, I am an artist, but I just love the tradition of printmaking and that craft component of it. It's like making a huge woodcut, woodcut like this takes a lot of work and sort of accumulation of of knowledge. Um, say, um, same idea. This is this is about fifty little woodcuts printed um, onto uh, laminated onto uh, panels of wood that were then sort of installed in this you know, interesting corner shape. And this is when I started to realize that to make big projects, you needed help. Um, this is probably like about 130 inches. So it's like, it's pretty big and I needed help. I needed students, I needed volunteers. Um, I needed volunteers because I needed this, this huge schematic and template to set it up and to print. And that's kind of like, it, got, it, it was like, it was just really cool to have, to be like, hey, you want to come over, help me out, learn a little bit of the process. We'll, you know, drink beer and pizza after, you know, I mean, now I pay people, but then I was like, I thought that was enough. I was wrong. Um, but, but folks were excited and they learned from me. Um, you know, I, any, any time I work with someone, it has to be something more than just experience, you know? Um, and so here it is in a, uh, in a different context, that's Tyler school of art. And you can kind of see the scale in that lobby, but these are all just layered woodcuts, different images. I mean, there's like a giant process behind this and accumulation of skills and a lot of other people learn this process. Um, and that's kind of exciting. Um, and you can, I'm trying to see if you can see the detail. You can see there's a little bit of relief. And that just means that the, the prints, and actually I should go back, those are the prints that were cut out. And you can see the negatives to create that composition. But with a lot of help and thinking about it, and you know, you have to like everything's like a number, and you need a, you know, it's like it, it was, I guess the short of it is really nice to get help and to work with other people and get other people's opinions instead of me just being a studio artist, right? Like, this is what I'm doing. Um, and that led me to maybe one of my favorite projects. Yeah, that other slide was out of, uh, out of order. This was a altar, a collaborative altar piece I made with Philly, with um, the South Philly Latinx community. Um, and I invited about 50 or 60 artists or just anybody interested in, in uh, working on the piece and everybody submitted images, photos, objects, things that they thought were interesting to this uh, um, Day of the Dead uh, celebration, Dia de Muertos. Um, my father, you know, uh, did a lot of extensive research in this, so they thought that it'd be an interesting uh, way for me to engage the community that way. So with the CNC router, I was able to uh, harness images, drawings, significant things from this community. And I did this digitally. I invited artist friends that I know in Mexico, West Coast, but mostly South Philly artists. And I was able to make these plates with a the machine. There's the router, uh, um, you know, reducing that plate and making that image. That, that photo came on the day that I invited the person. They're like, here, uh, this is my uh, deceased grandfather. And they pulled out one of those oval shaped photos of them from their wallet, you know, and it had the little dog gear there. And so I thought I would keep that. I could have easily on the computer fixed that, but no, that was like part of the detail. And the second component of it is once we made all of these woodcuts, I was able to run workshops where everybody was able to combine their ideas, their symbols. So I taught the process. I created this sort of collaborative uh, experience and they were able to learn the process as well right and combine their symbol the candle the candle uh when you make an ofrenda that candle is meant to draw the spirits in on that day that you celebrate them again this could be a whole talk in itself um it was presented at a deconsecrated church in south philly made that awesome armature again with a lot of the help and then after the workshop and the prints were made the blocks were inked up and they were left to dry so that they become this presentation and everybody's prints and collaborative work was put into this church, a great setting. 
and then everybody came in on this on the special day and contributed to all the important things that go on into an ofrenda which is you know perishable goods that the spirits come and partake and are celebrated on that day again a whole talk in itself uh this is the kind of stuff i really geek out about um just graphics layering creating um sort of like the more effect right like that like illusion of movement and just playing with color again in the end i just love uh squishing ink on paper and playing with color i mean you know and and that's totally okay uh the source of this image though is also collaborative um as uh, another artist brought a harmonograph tool to tyler school of art and the harmonograph tool is a pendulum drawing tool it has weights on it and you attach a sharpie or whatever and you set it in motion and then it, and you can draw it. i use the sharpie but you can use brushes ink drips but essentially the source of those spirals is just uh, a sharpie that was drawn onto a piece of paper and as it loses momentum it creates that spiral and then of course i manipulate it digitally and make the wood blocks with it so here are some more examples of all of that and you can make drawings like that also with pen and ink but i like to be able to control it a little more and so i am ink them up and make wood cuts uh with uh with a cnc and you know i'm able to uh collaborate uh that way um i also love to print with found materials that you know the holidays are a really good uh opportunity for for to collect um materials and other objects that i find like you know ribbons uh the the stuff on the top left is that thing that they bail the christmas trees with so it's just like the mesh that holds it but so that you don't wreck it putting it in your car um so i cut it up and save it ribbons wood blocks pretty much anything i find philly has a lot of trash so i find a lot of trash and found objects and then turn it into these beautiful objects are beautiful to me you know and then also mix it with uh, my color sensibility and this whole library of plates uh that i work with and these are the same plates that a lot of these are the same plates that i bring to the workshop so that everybody can work with them and pick their colors and i learned from that so sort of the same thing there you can re clearly see some of those like mesh uh bags of like potatoes or like and you know here you have wood but in philly if you don't go to the woods you like buy buy wood to burn i know that's crazy but you know sometimes you just want to have a bonfire and you don't have dead trees just falling so you know you buy it and the bottom right thing on the orange one is this thing that held like you know like 15 logs for like eight dollars <laughs> but anyway i'd love to collect that right i'm giving it a second life i'm upcycling it and i'm still using it and i brought some to this workshop so i love that component of sort of continuing that and teaching with it um and yeah so it, it's just like this accumulation of things and i love upcycling and i love using trash and i love graphics and here i am sort of in action during the pandemic making prints uh for other artists so i guess that's pretty much it you know pretty pretty short and sweet but yeah that, that that's what i do come by and check out what we're up to this week thank you so much alexis okay Next, our final speaker for this evening, we welcome back Caroline Silverman in the Fiber Studio. And to introduce her, we have our assistant, Amelia Stern. Hello, everyone. I am Amelia. Um, Caroline is an artist and writer who works at the intersection of annotation object and context um, and she taught the embroidery workshop here earlier this summer um, it's been lovely working with her um, she currently maintains a multidisciplinary studio practice in brooklyn new york and teaches at the rhode island school of design in providence rhode island please help me in welcoming caroline silverman <laughs> um 
thank you, Amelia, for that introduction. And thank you to Peters Valley for having me back. And thanks to many of you who are about to hear a very similar presentation to one that I gave a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Caroline. Um, I titled this presentation, Annotation, Narrative, and Context, um, because these are three factors that I really keep in mind um, all the time, but especially when approaching a new body of work or a new project or a new idea that I'm having. Um, I am really interested in thinking about where the textiles I'm working with came from, who touched them, how they've worn in over time, and kind of the, the zeitgeist that they exist in, because they're like always close to our bodies, right? Like all of us are wearing textiles right now. And that is the thing that really like got me into this in the first place. Um, as Amelia mentioned, I teach a digital embroidery class at RISD. Um, this is the machine that I teach. Um, it's uh, basically a really fancy sewing machine that is designed for commercial embroidery production. So like anything that you might buy that has embroidery on it, unless it says explicitly that it was done by hand was probably done on a machine like this. And so with teaching this class, I spend a lot of time thinking about this intersection between like digital technology and like really long standing hand traditions of making. Um, and I think especially for people who hear that I do a lot of embroidery work, um, what they're immediately picturing is really different from like the digital programming and like the way that I um, communicate with a lot of the students that I work with and also like a lot of the experiments and like weird materials that we operate on the machine. This is a project I'm working on right now that um, I'm doing a grant in collaboration with Susan Jehoda over at um, UMass Amherst, where we're designing these pedagogical tools um, for different workshop settings. And so this is a giant symbol that will be um, used in those tools. So, um, so yeah, this is an example and for context, the sort of um, studio work that I do a lot of the time. Um, this is my dad's family. That's my dad in the front with the really big ears. Um, and uh, I have this picture here because uh, I moved to Providence for college when I was 18. And at the time, I thought that I was going to go into illustration. I was very interested in narrative then as well. And um, as soon as I moved to Providence, I didn't grow up there, but both of my parents and their families are from there. And so I was really struck by this kind of super imposition of this sort of family history that was unfolding as I started learning more landmarks and like getting more familiar with the city. And it became a lot more conversations like calling home like on the weekends and it would be like, oh yeah, my, my great uncle ran a bar on that corner or like, oh yeah, my dad actually grew up in that house a few blocks away from where you were hanging out with your friends this weekend. And that sort of like casual storytelling unfolding with these like calls to home um, really got to me. And so um, this is the house, this is the porch of the house where my dad grew up in um, the Hope area of Providence, not Hope area of Providence. And this is um, a project that I made my freshman year of college where I had interviewed my parents and also like their siblings to ask them about like the kitchen spaces of these houses that they lived in and like basically made um, like footprint maps of like how you would make a specific recipe in each specific kitchen based off of like where the sink was and where the fridge was and like how you would move around that space. Um, I still thought I was going to illustration when I made this, <laughs> but, uh, but I had a really um, astute TA who was like, mm, I feel like you should maybe start to talk to folks who are working with textiles and like sort of unpack this a bit more. Um, and so I did. And uh, this is a piece that I made my senior year of college on a um, industrial jacquard loom with my grandmother's handwriting and uh, of like a family recipe superimposed over um, the print of the couch that my parents have in their living room that was handed down from her living room. And so really um, kind of continuing exploring the sort of middle space between things that are very much like of the hand and like of a very um, analog action and a repeated action, and then things that have this really um, digital, glitchy, staticky sort of lens. Um, also, the bright colors. This is this is uh, glowing that way because this is actually the wall of my apartment, and I am known for taking photos during like golden hour. So this is like 
especially glowing, but um, like Alexi, I'm really drawn to these like really bright colors that really like hum and sing together. And so, um, especially over the last few years, um, this interest in like, how can we get that hum with the sort of analog action led me to start this series of um, working on these like neon signs that are actually just quilts and beads together. Um, and so I hand sewed each of these on by hand and spent uh, over a year doing this and was really invested in that repeated process and that sort of almost, I mean, at the time we were all in lockdown still and like thinking about the, like the neon glow of an open sign at a gas station, but like so exotic and foreign. Um, so like one, it was this meditation on like the idea of things being open, but also like, you know, this really intensive, like soothing in some ways, manic in other ways, like repeated action of like, bringing each bead in and out of fabric every time. Um, and so here is a detail shot of the back that I think, um, I mean, I love the front of this piece, but the back to me really speaks to like the experience of making it a lot more where it's really like, you can see like areas where the thread just got tangled and I was like, just like tie, like an active mark making it and more just like, um, I don't know, more just like breathing or like like a like a process that didn't feel uh premeditated in that way anymore. Um but I love neon signs, I love gas stations, I love these sort of ubiquitous like markers of like common language or experience where you could be like driving home from somewhere and like see the golden glow of like, ah, oh, yeah, that's what I want. I want that comfort. And so I started painting these like bags of potato chips from gas stations and like really falling into this idea of like neon colors as an allusion to like highlighting a text, like lifting things out in order to like save them and remember them for later. And so I've done this a lot with different, um, different images. This is a digital embroidery of a painting that I made of a photo that I took. Um, and so again, kind of like translating from one medium to another and like kind of back again. And this idea of like lifting out selected pieces of information. Um, and this piece built on a series that I also made on the embroidery machine um, where I had this effort of really seeing how color and texture could really impact um, the way that you would feel looking at the same image. And a lot of people have done this, um, of course, but I was really interested in it um, with this subject matter. Um, this is another couch. I really love couches also. Of um, It's actually a couch display at a Goodwill in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina that um, I was visiting with my dad who casually pointed out that that fabric, um, the fabric for like the couch with that fabric on it, um, belong to somebody else in the family, um, obviously a different couch, but again, like this kind of echoing of like these familial motifs that we have like so much, like feels like fate or like destiny, or like we have these really intense emotional reactions to, but are still like these mass produced fabrics. So like they're rare, but they're not like especially selective materials, but I found it, I found it in this thrift store. And so I just snapped a photo of it and turned that photo into a painting, um, which I'll show you in a second, and then turned that into the series of embroideries where um, this is just one of the colorways, but I made about 10 different studies trying to get, um, get it thinking about like, you know, what are the colors of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? What are the colors of Providence, Rhode Island, where the couch lived its life, you know? And thinking about um, different ways that memory and connotation can affect um, your relationship to the image. Um, this is the original painting of that couch that I made. Um, and then here is another uh, different painting of the couch that I made much later with like a much higher resolution photo. Um, but the sort of iter iterative process is also something that's really reoccurring for me in a lot of different ways. Um, I really love to marinate with ideas. Um, so I end up circling back to things um, often after a long time. And speaking of setting with things, also, this is a, a body of work that I made during COVID lockdown. Um, this series is called Solstice, and I began um, sewing a series of daily quilts on the summer solstice in uh, June 2020. 
and sewed one every day until the fall equinox of the same year. Um, I did miss two days. One was a day that I cut my thumb when I was making dinner and I just totally forgot. I think that was day eight. And the second was the day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Um, and I totally forgot again. But all of the other days are up here. I think there's a total of 98 different days. Um, and they're arranged in order on the wall. Um, this is them on display at the yard in Williamsburg. Um, and you can see here is days one through, I think it's 28 on this wall. Um, and here's a selection of days from the middle on the back. And the final selection of days. And you can see there are some days where I clearly had much more of a capacity to spend time on this project than other days. Um, when I thought of the idea, I truly, I never thought that they would go anywhere. I was almost treating it almost like a journalistic entry where I was just um, making them, tagging them with a number and like putting them into a stack. And um, it wasn't until the following year when I began posting the corresponding date from the year before on Instagram every day that I started actually kind of thinking about these as a collection um, where when I was making them, um, it, we were very much in like the ritualistic, like, many days seem to be bleeding together phase of the pandemic, but also, um, you know, regardless of like what was going on that day or where I was, or, I mean, I was usually at home, but there were some days where I wasn't and like didn't have access to a sewing machine. And there are some of these that are made out of napkins. Um, so like this really interesting um, shift in my process where normally I have a really set idea going into something. And this one for me was, the idea was there, but the result of it was much less predictable and much more about actually the process of making it, um, which is not a way that I've worked a lot, but is something that I'm really interested in, especially after this piece. Um, and also the importance of like sitting with these for a long time, being able to see the, the day previously as I started making the new day, I think that like sitting with these and really lifting with them for a long time um, ended up having a large impact in my work. Um, this is also a uh, sort of typical state of what my studio section of my studio apartment looks like um, with things just kind of layered on top of each other. A lot of things are in progress, especially in this photo, obviously in this photo, but really getting to see the, the relationships that sort of emerge over time beyond like the, the way that you kind of immediately will understand everything together. I really have uh, views like this a lot of the time that when I'm working on other things, I'll just kind of like gaze my sight line over and suddenly notice something new, a new relationship between different pieces. And those in turn help inform the next iteration of making. Um, this here is a little sneak peek of the project that I'm working on the most right now. I mean, a lot of things are on the burner, but this is where I'm trying to focus the most of my attention um, as sort of a follow-up piece to the open beaded sign that I showed you earlier. This is going to be a neon ATM sign. Um, so this one is also addressing like a change in scale as well. And so um, it's a little bit hard to see here, um, but I hope to have more complete photos to show very soon. Um, but yeah, so a lot of synthesis of um, still returning back to this conversation between the hand and also kind of like a more electric um, or a more digital understanding and like really trying to find different things in the spaces in between the two. Um, that is all I have for today. But if anyone wants to look at more, there's my website. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you to all the instructors who shared their work with us today. That was a lovely group of talks. Thank you, whether you were here in person or electronically on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us and for being here. Um, students, if you have any questions, or if you need anything, the office is open on the weekend and the gallery is as well. So please stop on by and they can help you out. Otherwise, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your workshops. <laughs> Hello and thank you so much for watching this program. Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.